So welcome everyone. I'd just like to start with a uh, round of applause for the uh, for Vero, uh, Claudia, and their students who did the artwork out in the uh, out in the front. I'm Dr. Andrew Kraus, the superintendent here at ACS, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you and to our General Assembly, and also to welcome all of those that are joining us virtually tonight um, via the live link. As we begin, I just want to place our guiding statements at the center of what we do. Our mission represents what we do. We challenge and inspire students to be critical thinkers, lifelong learners, and responsible world citizens through an English-based education. Our core values represent how we do things, and our vision is our preferred future. While these foundational statements have served ACS for well over a decade, tonight we'll also begin a process that will invite our whole community to ponder whether they are sufficient to guide us into the next decade or not. But before we get to that, we've got some introductions to do, and we've got a number of presentations which will uh, we'll talk about the exciting work that's going on this, in the school right now. To get us started with that, um, I'd like to invite Josh Darding, our board president, to introduce our board of trustees, and I'd also like to invite all the trustees to come up on stage to be introduced at this time. So please join us. Josh Darting. I'm the president of the board. Um, Annie here is our vice president. Got a raise your hand. Um, we have Lena Beltran, who is our secretary, and Martin Mintz, who is our treasurer. Um, additionally, we have uh, Andrea, Tati, Dan, and Leo. And we're all here to serve you guys. So as a board, we focus on strategic issues, uh, where we want to take ACS in the next five years, the next 10 years, and beyond. Uh, we cover a wide range of uh, issues and topics, um, and in doing so, we've organized ourselves into five committees. Um, the committees are listed there along with uh, contact information, so if you want to write them down to address any issues within their scope, uh, please do so. Uh, the first is finance, uh, led by Martin. Uh, this focuses on keeping uh, ACS moving forward in a positive direction financially. Uh, the team looks for ways to improve uh, quality while also seeking out savings. Uh, additionally, they seek to grow our capital investment account. Uh, the next is facilities, led by Leo. Uh, their team seeks to provide a physical environment that is safe for our kids and is conducive to a productive learning environment. His team is addressing everything from lighting and heating to space utilization. Uh, additionally, they are putting together a plan that improves the outward appearance of the school in an effort to attract new students. Uh, the next committee is governance, led by myself, uh, where we seek to uh, provide policies that are fair and enforced equally among the student body and the institution as a whole. The next committee is academics, led by Tati. Uh, this focuses on strategic issues that will grow our students and our teachers. Uh, her team will, look, will work closely with our director of teaching and learning to elevate our academic programs in order to provide our students with a better education and again, attract new students to the, the community, or to the, uh, the school itself. Um, finally, the last uh, committee we have is community outreach. This is led by Andrea. Uh, this focuses on connecting the board to you as parents. So we cannot achieve all of our goals without working together. That includes the administration, the school board, and parents. So this is the best community, or best committee um, to connect everyone together. Uh, one thing I would like to note is we still have two available positions on the board, one American position and one third country national position. So if you feel um, like you would uh, like to join the board and you, you fit one of those categories, uh, please contact me and we'll uh, look at moving forward. Thanks.
thank you, Josh, and thank you to our trustees. I, I think, um, you know, we, we often shorten that, that, that title to board member, or the board, rather than the board of trustees, but I really think that full title really means something, that because the board really holds the school in trust for the future generations of ACS students, and that's really a weighty responsibility. And I thank them for uh, executing that with such professionalism. Um, the conversations with, with the board aren't always easy. They're, they're, they're often challenging. But, uh, but, but, they're, but they're always in the spirit of looking, looking forward to um, and providing the very best um, for ACS now and in the future. So thank you very much, um, Board of Trustees. Um, Today we're going to move um, in some ways from the nuts and bolts to the more, uh, to the more abstract. And, uh, and the uh, one place where the nuts and bolts is always very visible is in our financial um, uh, uh, results. And so I'd like to invite uh, Daniela gonzalez Keep, our business manager, and she'll tell us about the financial health of the school. Welcome, Daniela. Good evening, everyone. So today I will make some updates in the financial part. As you can see in the graph, the total amount of debt as of September is 495000 we can also say that during the pandemic years, the total debt was around 600000 As you can see now, this amount has reduced in recent years. All these given the collection policies implemented by the school. For this school year, our budget is around 5 million US dollars, which as of September, 16% has been spent. As of September, we have 575 students enrolled elementary with 293, secondary with 240. Till the end of the school year, we are expected 590 students. During the first quarter, the school has carried out maintenance on facilities. The total amount spent to September is 110 US dollars. There is still work to be done, so the estimate budget for this is around 75 US dollars. $5, Last August, our play on was inaugurated with a total cost of $75,740 US dollars. At last year's gala, $19,084 were raised. All these thanks to the special support of our community. The school incurred a cost of $56,656 to complete this beautiful project. Thank you, Daniela, and, and welcome, Bernie. Um, we'll um, we'll move on. Bernie is our uh, into our facilities uh, uh, area. Uh, Bernie uh, takes care of all of our facilities, including. Um, the maintenance team, but also looks after the security and health provisions at the school, as well as the uh, the infrastructure associated with technology. So she'll tell you about uh, about various of those aspects. Ready? Good evening, everybody. I'm so glad to be here and show you a little bit what my team and I will uh, have done during the summer. Um, on May, uh, hydraulic test on our storm water and sanitary sewer system were made all around the school. It reported 98% of our pipes um, failed the test. So we have to think very quick and start to do something for that. The most important part was elementary and we divided this big work in three stages. The stage one was done, as I said, in elementary so there's a few photos here, so you can imagine uh, how, how big was the work. Um, another major work was done in the pool area. Uh, it was time to uh, change the water. Uh, we should do it um, every five years because of the pandemic. It has been seven years and it was the moment to change the water. So we decided to repaint the interior pool. Um, we changed the underwater lights and all the electrical connections, and um, and we replaced 
places uh, replace uh, a little bit of pipes. There's a lot of work to do, but the most important things have done. Um, we also paint the interior of the building and the exterior part, and we reseal all the roof of the uh, the glass of the roof. That it, we, it was very important. We also repaired the telescope that it was a lot of years that the student couldn't uh, take advantage of so beautiful equipment that we have at the school. We fixed the routine dome and we bought a solar filter. And this photo was taken by the students through our telescope. Additionally, the routine of end of the year maintenance has been done. Uh, we made maintenance inside the classrooms and outside. And this year, uh, the repair was done in more detail. And I'm really proud that my, my team responded positively and they elevated the quality of their job, their, their performance and their work. They showed a lot of enthusiasm and initiative to do the test, so I'm very grateful for that. We add some colors inside the classes, the classrooms, and we made as much as we can in a short time to, to improve our furniture and our facilities. Um, we also continue this summer as much as we can, uh, changing the lights through, um, converting to LED. We didn't um, end this task, but we are keep doing that. And we are also, um, we are taking care about the electrical connections around the school that are very old. In the administration office, we reorganize the offices and we do, we do some maintaining also. And about the, our new playground, uh, we remove the old playground, all the equipment, we level the ground, we cement the surface and install the new playground. Is that the kids are so so happy to have it. I enjoy seeing, seeing them in all the all the races. Uh, and at the, for last, we the rubber floor was installed. It's a very good portion of the of the playroom, and the kids are enjoying a lot. Um, as Andrew said, I am in charge also about the technology. Uh, part of the school and we acknowledge that we have a lot of issues with the Wi-Fi connection. We have invited three companies to, to give us a quote for a diagnosis and assessment and solutions for, the, for our problem. One of the companies was selected and they are going to start the, the, the diagnostic process in a few days. And I will keep you informed in the message that the superintendent sent every Monday about the results, and hopefully this will this won't take a long time. Um, we have some some work to do until the end of the year. We have to finish the, the stage two and three of, of the pipes. It's a lot of work, so we have to do it only. And during the breaks. We are going to start on December and the next summer. Um, to improve our pool, that uh, we need a pool thermal co cover and improve the connection, the electrical connections and the lights and the internet that I just mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie, and also th thank you to your team. I, I, I just want to say uh, um, a, a couple words about Bernie and her team. Bernie has, uh, has really brought the team together and had the team uh, really form as a solid team. 
Um, she, they have uh, been training on a variety of, uh, of additional tasks, as well as they've even been involved when we've had vacancies on the maintenance team, they've been involved, brought into the interviewing uh, even, so that they, they take a lot more ownership of, uh, of this area of the school. And so I thank you, Bernie, for your leadership there also. Next, uh, we'll move on to the academic area, and I, I'll be introducing someone who, uh, who uh, is, is not brand new to the school anymore, but, uh, but, but she's new this year. That's uh, Dr. Ann Peterson. Um, we're, uh, her position is a new one this year at the school as Director of Learning and Teaching, and we're so very happy to have her, and, uh, and I'm excited for her to, uh, to tell you a little bit more about what she's been doing this year. Welcome, Ann. taking the time to attend our General Assembly. Um, it is my pleasure to be able to stand before you tonight and share an update regarding the state of teaching and learning here at ACS. Um, I happen to know that several of you have been wondering, understandably so, what has Anne been up to? Um, and while this evening I won't be able to um, provide an exhaustive report, I definitely will be able to shine the light on some key undertakings and accomplishments and plans for the future. Um, I will share some highlights of progress in key areas, many of which began before my arrival. Oops. As you can likely imagine, my role is a new one for the school, and that means that it continues to evolve, which I actually find very, very exciting. Um, I want to, before we dive into academics, I want to share with you that I stand before you this evening with my heart being full of gratitude. Even before my arrival, I felt very fortunate to have been selected to fulfill this inaugural role for ACS. And it brings me joy to be able to share with you that since joining ACS, my gratitude has grown even further. I'm very grateful for the warm welcome that I have received from students, colleagues, and parents. I'm grateful to feel faith and trust that many of you have in me and in the team. And I'm grateful that I feel confident that I will be able to continue to garner faith and trust from this community as our work together continues. To close this note of gratitude, it would be hugely remiss of me to not mention the immense gratitude I have for the senior leadership team. I really feel like I've won the lottery. Although we've been only collaborating for a relatively short period of time, I value the team wholeheartedly, and perhaps most importantly, I feel valued in return. I'm confident that our strengths will continue to complement one another as we create the future of ACS together. So to the leadership team, thank you. Um, as, I've been, as I've been listening and observing and getting to know our school and community, I have been thinking about the Japanese art of kintsugi. The translation from Japanese of kintsugi means golden joinery or repair with gold. And this technique involves taking broken pottery and rebuilding the piece, and this is my favorite phrase, with the result being a new, more beautiful version of itself. This technique transformed broken ceramic or pottery into beautiful art. It enhances the break lines with gold, giving the mended broken pottery a more beautiful and unique presentation. Kintsugi art is associated with the notion of rebirth, and this is why I've been thinking about it while here at ACS. The two words that continually come to mind as I contemplate the work ahead for our community are both opportunity and renewal. Our school has experienced challenging times, and these times have left us with chipped and broken pieces. I am hopeful that just like the art of Kintsugi, we will embrace this breakage, pick up the pieces, and create a new and more beautiful version of ACS. Okay, so let's transition into the nitty gritty of the academics. Um, these are the elements that make up my role as Director of Learning and Teaching. 
And what you see are the screen are sort of the major buckets that make up my role, which of course these all blend into one another in some way, shape, or form. Um, but what I'm going to do is talk about six of these areas this evening. You'll notice at the top of the slide the words listening and learning. And my first response when I'm often asked, okay, well, what have you been up to? <laughs> is that I say I've been listening. I've been listening, observing, and learning as I try to ascertain not only our areas for improvement as a school, but I seek understanding of the ACS story because the, the ACS story is a beautiful one of which there is so much to be proud. I, I've been in multiple international schools and I have experienced firsthand what happens when leadership comes in with ideas, most of which are very solid, but fails to first seek understanding prior to leading change. So while there are concrete examples of accomplished tasks thus far, I think it's important to, to know that I have spent and I will continue to spend time getting to know our community through fully invested listening and observing. As with many aspects in life, I believe in finding the right balance, in this case, finding the most impactful and successful pace of change. Um, with regard to academic policies and practices, I have learned that we are in need of either thoroughly reviewing or even creating policies and practices that follow along from those policies in these key areas, assessment, language, learning support, and academic integrity. We are not currently in alignment, and when I speak about this, I do mean from the full school perspective of early childhood all the way through to our graduates. So we're not fully in alignment in these areas. We don't yet have common understanding. We don't have solid philosophical underpinnings. So this is work that is ahead of us. Um, I'm, a, I'm very pleased to share uh, that in collaboration with the leadership team and with the Board of Trustees approval, we've applied to transition from being accredited by an organization which is known as Cognia to being accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. Our rationale for this change is founded primarily on personal experience, knowing the quality of the NIAS process firsthand. We are really confident that this is going to complement our strategic planning and program improvement processes in both the short and long term. We are continuing our partnerships with two external consultants this year. Steve Barkley, who is assisting us with professional growth, providing cognitive coaching for members of the leadership team and beyond, and with Nicole Fedio, who has been instrumental in leading a thorough review of our mathematics programs and practices. Through Nicole's work, we have two newly created sections of mathematical explorations through problem solving, designed to bolster student confidence and capability in mathematics in the middle school. And Nicole is also leading the secondary team in considering how we can restructure our pathways in mathematics in the middle and high school. Nicole is collaborating with teachers, which includes providing demonstration lessons with our students, which is one of the most effective ways for teachers to improve their practice. Right. This mathematics uh, work that is being done leads into the bucket of curriculum overall. When we think about curriculum, we think of it as the overall experience of the learner, which means it contains pretty much everything. Um, as we've gathered input on the state of the current curriculum, we recognize the need to conduct a thorough curriculum review process. So we began by developing the criteria against which our curriculum would be reviewed, and we organized that criteria into three categories. The written curriculum, our approaches to teaching, and our approaches to learning. We've begun the review process by starting with the elementary school team, providing feedback on the state of the written curriculum. And just as an example, from the data, we're identifying priorities, one of which we have already realized is in the area of social studies. The secondary school will be contributing in the same manner, and the process will continue with the formation of smaller committees who will create and manage action plans based on the data gathered. I understand that the school began the process of considering the adoption of the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program for grades 11 and 12.
This is an undertaking that must be considered thoroughly and carefully and should arrive from the school's curriculum review and the strategic planning process. If the school does indeed determine that this could be a positive move forward for our school, I would just like to assure the community that that, trend, the, that tr sort of transition would be meticulously planned and executed. It is not something to take on lightly. Um, I would like to just put a little um, shout out to our uh, early childhood team, KG3 to KG5. Um, they are often referred to as ECE, Early Childhood Educa Education, um, for their desire to collaborate with one another and, and transition to a more inquiry and play-based program. I often say that all learning environments should look like early childhood, where students are led by curiosity and guided towards gaining knowledge and understanding through outstanding facilitation. And I really look forward to continuing with the work with the team. Um, when it comes to professional development, we have continued to fine-tune the work that began with Steve Barkley. And so we have teachers that are working on individual or team and or team uh, professional development goals. I would really like to share with you today that we had a wonderfully successful event. We, had, we hosted um, a Teachers Teaching Teachers workshop. And the excitement around what everyone experienced this afternoon from 3.30 to 5 was really palpable. And we had such positive feedback. And so I want to thank our teachers, our, our presenters who, who uh, volunteered to, to present and share their knowledge and expertise. And I can uh, say really with assurance that people left this afternoon feeling, feeling very grateful and feeling that their time was spent in a very useful manner. Our teachers learned from one another. The workshops ranged from food security to using film in the classroom to AI to visual journey to juggling and, and even more. So again, thank you to our teachers. A bit later in the program, and as it's already been mentioned uh, earlier this evening, Dr. Krause will be speaking to you about reimagining in what ways we might be able to do school differently. When I learned that ACS was in the final year of its strategic plan, I felt excited by this opportunity to help lead the community in deep reflection about what school has looked like, what it currently looks like, and what it could and should look like in the future. And this is a very important part of my role, to ensure that we are aware of trends and research in education. Schools in general are historically slow to change. We are fortunately reaching a point in our human development that making educational change is essentially an imperative. Uh, three publications I happened to read this week, uh, one from the National Center on Education and the Economy, one from Ernst & Young, and one from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, all concerning the future of education. They all emphasize our mandate to reimagine and restructure. This is just a sampling of some of the words used throughout these articles, all of which are elements that we here at ACS need to be giving ample attention to as we imagine what ACS will be like today, tomorrow, five years, 10 years, into the future and more. I believe that currently all of these areas listed here are areas of growth for ACS. And I also believe that our community has the capacity to learn about each of these with open minds and in turn create an educational program that positively impacts all of our students' lives. As my time comes to a close, I'd like to ask each of you to consider these questions. Who comes to mind when you think about a teacher who impacted you greatly as a student or who is impacting you greatly for those of our, for, for our students in the audience this evening. What qualities or behaviors did the teacher exhibit? How did the teacher make you feel? My guess is that some of the following come to mind. Having felt seen, heard, and valued. Having felt that you were an important part of the group having felt that someone cared, 
Perhaps other elements come to mind. Perhaps you felt inspired, challenged, motivated, full of gratitude or admiration. The point here is that these are special people. These are special people in our lives. And when it all comes down to it in a nutshell, it's all about the teacher. And for this, I feel gratitude. I feel gratitude for teachers who understand and embrace our calling with a growth mindset, who are learners for life, and who accept challenges with grit and determination. I'm grateful for teachers who are passionate about what they do, who are knowledgeable and skilled, caring and empathetic, who collaborate and strive for collective efficacy. I greatly appreciate when teachers see education as a transformational experience, fully focused on learning versus a transactional one that tends to be focused on grades. And I appreciate those who see each learner before them as a unique individual whose life they can and will impact. I will close by sharing a quote that I find still, every time I read it, quite profound. In 2006, Roland Barth summarized his research with the following statement. One incontrovertible finding emerges from my career spent working in and around schools. The nature of relationships among adults within a school has greater influence on the character and quality of that school and on student accomplishment than anything else. If the relationships between administrators and teachers are trusting, generous, helpful, and cooperative, then the relationships between teachers and students, between students and students, and between teachers and parents are likely to be trusting, generous, helpful, and cooperative. Again, every time I read it, I find, I find it profound. And, and I, I, think it's, I think it's relevant for us in our community. In summary, we have many strengths including a rich history, a passionate community, teachers and leaders prepared to forge change. We also have areas for growth that include developing a collective innovator's mindset, establishing commonly held beliefs about teaching and learning, and perhaps most importantly, collaborating on a foundation that is built uh, on trust. I am confident that just like with the art of Kintsugi, that together we can build and have already begun to build a better and more beautiful version of ACS. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Anne. You uh, you mentioned gratitude in a number of number of times in your uh, in your talk, and we are certainly grateful for you. We're grateful for you challenging us for you encouraging us and for you deepening our thinking. And we're better, a better team for it and a better school for it. So thank you. At this time, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to invite um, our new elementary school principal, who, uh, who it's my first time also introducing at a general assembly, um, Eric Crabtree, to, uh, to come up and tell us a little bit about the state of the elementary school. So Eric, welcome. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to share with you the progress and achievements we've made in the elementary division as we approach the 12th week of this school year. Our focus on meaningful teaching and learning, along with programmatic improvements, have yielded some remarkable outcomes. All of this work falls under three main goals we've developed for the division this year. One, creating a trusting community. Two, posing teachers as researchers using assessment to deliver meaningful instruction and inspire powerful learning, and three, using explicit strategies and training to help position parents as partners in our students' learning. Here are some of the highlights of our recent work in the elementary. First and foremost, as a new administrator here at ACS, 
I placed a strong emphasis on building meaningful relationships with our team and gaining a deeper understanding of each member's strengths and skill sets. I've held introductory meetings with all faculty members, including our dedicated instructional assistants. Throughout these meetings, I have been consistently impressed with the passion and the commitment of these people. We've introduced several important evolutions to our elementary programming. We've launched a distributed leadership model within the division, with committees and teams responsible for various aspects such as departmental leadership, drafting a new schedule for the 24-25 school year, and reviewing our elementary curricula. Our student support services plan has been revisited, which includes the implementation of weekly student study team, or SST, meetings. These meetings involve learning lab specialists and teachers helping to outline supports and interventions for students who require academic, social, or emotional assistance. The MAP testing process in the elementary school has been adjusted. Students now take the tests in their homeroom classes with modifications to testing times. We've also decided to exempt KG5 from the testing roster this year, and next year, grade one will no longer take MAP tests. We've established the Elementary School Leadership Council, consisting of students from grades three through five, some of whom are in this room right now. This council, under the guidance of coordinator Annie Floru, meets weekly to create service learning opportunities for all students, to promote agency, and to incorporate student voices into our daily school life. In the cafeteria, we've implemented a healthy choices meal plan for elementary students. Snacks during the week are low in sugar and fat, with some exceptions on Fridays, and hot meals now come with a vegetable. We've transformed October student-led conferences into more meaningful parent-teacher conferences, giving parents and teachers an opportunity to connect and build trust and meaningful relationships for the betterment of their children, our students. We now host parent coffees twice a month, the first session involves a presentation on, a various, on various topics, while the second is a collaborative session where parents work together to build skills and solve some family problems. Faculty training and accomplishments on Wednesdays have covered a rich and uh, rich in various areas, including the development of common agreements for teaching and curricula imp implementation, upskilling our faculty on running records, rec reading assessments, working with multilingual learners, the new learning lab structure, assessment and reporting improvements, and launching a professional growth plan to facilitate teacher learning and development. We've held a parent communications workshop to enhance our teachers' abilities in handling difficult conversations or addressing challenging topics with parents. We've conducted a workshop for teachers in grades one through five, focusing on using that, the recent MAP test scores to set goals and measure growth throughout the school year. As Ann mentioned earlier, we also had a very successful teacher learning workshop today, known as a TTT, or Teachers Teaching Teachers. This has been established to spread expertise among our faculty and to invest in a culture of professional learning. Additionally, we've done small things like started a faculty and staff sunshine committee, which helps to build and strengthen our internal community through the spreading of positivity, celebrating when community members have celebratory events, and grieving with community members during times of bereavement. These achievements reflect our commitment to strengthening our school community, community developing our teachers and faculty members, and investing in our academic programming to provide the best possible education and support for our students. We remain deeply grateful for your continued support and dedication to our shared mission. Thank you for walking this journey with us. Thank you, Eric. If, if you've gotten to know Eric at all, you've, you, you know that he's a dynamo of activity. He, uh, we, we thought maybe the uh, bicycle accident would slow him down, but not, a, not, not at all. Um, thank you, Eric, for all the, uh, all the work that you're doing in our, uh, in our elementary school and for your leadership. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Tim Warren, our, our, uh, also new to, to our school, um, our new secondary school principal, to tell us a little bit about the state of the secondary school. Welcome, Tim.
Good evening. My name is Tim Warren. I'm honored to serve as a secondary principal. During my first few months here, I've been getting to know our school community and have found a group of qualified and caring teachers and compassionate, thoughtful, and intelligent students who are eager to learn and grow. It's been a pleasure to join this exciting and engaging environment, and I'm happy to tell you a bit about our progress. A few days ago, I returned from the middle school friendship games in Cochabamba, where our student athletes, spellers, and mathematicians did an amazing job representing our school. Our competitors worked hard and gave it their best, and really enjoyed their time together. Opportunities like this help develop critical teamwork skills, and also help them learn how to be good winners, as well as managing defeat. We're nearly finished with Measure of Academic Progress, or MAP, testing for our middle school students and PSAT testing for our students in grades 9 to 11. Standardized tests like these provide important information about learning and help us ensure that students are reaching academic goals and are on track compared to students in other schools. These, these results are also available to parents, and our teachers would be happy to sit down with you to discuss them. Last month, most students participated in Classroom Without Walls, our school-wide experiential learning opportunity, during which students visited and learned about local culture and history throughout Bolivia. While there were many positive experiences, there were also a variety of issues and concerns with the trips. Experiential learning is an important educational modality, and the CWW program needs careful review and perhaps an overhaul to ensure opportunities for relevant and engaging learning while mitigating increased travel costs, safety concerns, student management issues, and individual preferences. We will soon put together a committee to evaluate and redesign this program so that it better meets the learning needs of our students. Speaking of experiential learning, many of our high school students are very active in their efforts to understand the needs of others and provide service and support to, to disenfranchised groups in our community. Currently, students are involved in groups such as Guild Against Poverty, which partners with Helping Hands Bolivia to provide food and other items to those in need. Carbon Cutters, which works to reduce our carbon footprint by overseeing our recycling program and organizing educational programs for Earth Day. BioGuardians Group partners with Senda Verde to, to raise awareness about animal cruelty and trafficking. Hero partners with Unifrance to raise awareness about women's status and safety and provide education about women's health. And students recently produced, participated in Manitos, providing support to families of children that received needed hand surgery. Well, looking ahead, there are several focus areas for this year and into next year. We will continue to look for opportunities for personalized and relevant learning. We have a strong athletics program, but we'll also look to expand other opportunities in the arts, technology, community service, and career-related interests. Soon we'll start working on next year's academic schedule, addressing some of the current problems and limitations, and looking to provide a balance between choice, relevance, rigor, and providing a holistic, well-rounded educational experience. At the high school level, some adjustments may be made to our core class offerings to ensure that students can meet graduation requirements and university expectations, while still having opportunities for choice and individualized learning. We're also looking to better define our middle school identity. Middle school students have unique developmental needs and interests and require something different from what they experienced in elementary school while acknowledging the fact that they're not yet in high school. As we begin the second quarter, we're looking forward to our parent-teacher-student conference day scheduled for tomorrow. We know that parents are essential partners in their child's learning, and we're hopeful that making these connections, while it's still relatively early in the school year, will help build the support needed for the success of our students. Thank you for entrusting your students to us. Thank you, Tim. I truly appreciate your leadership and appreciate the, uh, the, the steady professionalism and experience that you bring to the position. I think it's exactly what our ACS secondary community needs right now. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to shift our focus just slightly to honoring students who have distinguished themselves in the area of academics. One of our greatest joys as a school is to celebrate our learners' achievements. 
And while all ACS students enrich our community, this evening we'll be recognizing students who have distinguished themselves by earning the very top grades in the school. There are two groups, sorry, there are two groups of students who we'll recognize tonight. The first group consists of the three students from last year's elementary and the three students from last year's secondary um, who have had the highest grades and whose family, uh, families pay full tuition. These students will receive a full scholarship from ACS this year. The second group consists of students whose parents do not pay their own tuition, but whose grades equal or exceed a student who is winning the scholarship. These students will receive a certificate of excellence. Some of you may note that in the past we followed a more complicated process for making these awards that took into account more holistic criteria um, that weren't limited to academics. We have made changes to the process to bring it rigorously in line with the Ministry of Education's regulations for this year. And thus, we have the, uh, the process that we're presenting to you. Uh, I'd like to invite at this time both our two principals as well as our board president to the stage to help me make the awards. It's my pleasure to announce our award winners in, from the elementary school last year, Azul Monroy. Augustina Valdivia. Thank you once again to all of our elementary school uh, winners. Um, please note they, uh, uh, they, they, they probably find it a little strange by saying that they're elementary school winners. They won in the elementary school yet. Uh, last year, uh, they are all actually now middle school students. So uh, congratulations once again to all three of you. Well done. I'll invite uh, Dr. Warren to now present the, uh, the names for the secondary award winners. Okay. For the uh, scholarship recipients, the first is Agustina Nasa. Thank you. 
Sanera. Excellence. First is Seon Lee. anything about strategic planning, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I've always relished being a little different. The pressure to conform to expectations is often overwhelming. When I was very young, I too felt that pressure and chose not to stand out as too smart or too independent. But sometime in elementary school, that changed for me and I became more comfortable expressing my own ideas. You may think that I'm a little strange being the, um, often as superintendent, being the only one with a tie on in the room, but you, you, would have, you would have been even more surprised on the days that I wore a tie to the playground in elementary school. It, it seemed a little more strange then, particularly when I convinced a group of my friends to do the same thing. As I grew up, I often saw individuals as a source of new and exciting ideas. I saw organizations as usually stifling that innovation. I thought their missions and visions were simply lifeless words in dusty frames hung on walls with little impact. That is, until I arrived at Ithaca College as a young professor. Ithaca College is a small undergraduate institution. Its physics department historically saw itself sitting in the shadow of its much larger neighbor, Cornell. For many years, the department only had a handful of annual graduates and a tired cadre of gray-haired old professors. Immediately following some retirements, though, a visionary department chair brought in a number of young professors. I was among them. We set out to construct a new mission, vision, and strategic plan for the department. Fast forward a few years, and our department was graduating the largest number of physics majors for an undergraduate-only program in the United States. Our department had become a shining example within the uni university, and our students were presenting research at conferences around the world. Since that time, I've truly believed in the power of innovative strategic planning when it's done with intentionality and consensus building across stakeholder groups. I'm sure many of you have worked in environments where innovative ideas were not given fertile ground to grow in, but I hope some of you have had the great fortune to work in organizations where great ideas thrive. Before I speak about how we can work together to grow an environment at ECS that looks like the latter and not the former, I want to tell you a cautionary tale that comes from a book called Zorba the Greek. Here, the story is told by the protagonist. He says, I remember one morning when I discovered a cocoon in the back of a tree, just as a butterfly was making a hole in its case and preparing to come out. 
I waited a while, but it was too long a period, and I was impatient. I bent over it and breathed on it to warm it up. It warmed it, I warmed it as quickly as I could, and the miracle began to happen before my eyes, faster than life. The case opened. The butterfly slowly started crawling out. And I shall never forget, with horror, when I saw how its wings were folded back and crumpled. The wretched butterfly tried with its whole trembling body to unfold them. Bending over it, I tried to help it with my breath, in vain. It needed to be hatched out patiently, and the unfolding of its wings should be a gradual process in the sun. Now it was too late. My breath had forced the butterfly to appear, all crumpled, before its time. I struggled desperately, and a few seconds later, or sorry, it struggled desperately, and a few seconds later died in the palm of my hand. That little body is, I do believe, the greatest weight I have on my conscience. Now, I think ACS is a little bit like this butterfly. ACS was born in the 1950s, grew up in the 1960s and 70s, and by the time the 80s and 90s rolled around, ACS looked like a beautiful caterpillar, thriving under the leadership of Herm Penland. Many of you remember it. As, at the turn of the millennium, ACS faced a number of crises, financial, political, and demographic. It built a cocoon around itself and tried to stay the same and not change in response to the chaos swirling around it. Now, ACS finds itself at the dawn of a new day. We have capacity that we've never had before. On the educational side, we have leaders with eminent qualifications who have led at prestigious institutions around the world. We have a non-academic team who has corrected inefficiencies and brought the school out of a state of, of neglect. ACS is now that butterfly getting ready to emerge from the cocoon. It's a delicate and dangerous stage, but our whole community, including myself, is filled with excitement for change. I see two pitfalls that could stop our progress. First, in our haste for change, we might try 10,000 things at once, blowing on the cocoon, picking at it, and drawing out the butterfly with all kinds of prods, only to find it lifeless in our hands. Instead, we must strategically focus our efforts. Secondly, in our nostalgia, we might not be bold enough. We might look into the past and paint the cocoon to look like the beautiful caterpillar from years ago, but simultaneously stifle the life in the, of the nascent butterfly. Thus, not ever recognizing the audacious possibility of what ACS could become and how we have all the ingredients to make a bold leap forward right now. For ACS to realize its full potential as an emerging butterfly, it needs your help. We need to collaboratively create a vision for the future, ACS. It's not for me to develop that, division, that, that, that vision. I'm just a, tear, a caretaker. Even if I stay as long as Herm Penland did, I can never duplicate the generational connection that many of you and your families have to our school. We need our whole community to build consensus about what ACS should, could, and will become. So how do you help? First, commit to allowing that butterfly surrounded by natural advantages with which we've provided it, emerge and spread its wings to its true potential. Please join me in, in choosing to do this. Secondly, if you believe strongly in the innovative future for ACS, and you're willing to help build that consensus among our community to make that future a reality, I invite you to express your interest in being part of a steering committee for our new strategic plan. You can do that with the QR code that's on the screen. We'll also send it out to everyone soon. The commitment for, the, for that committee will be for one meeting a month until the end of the academic year and some additional work between 
uh, should be expected between the different meetings. The first task of this team will be to build community consensus in answering whether our current mission, vision, and values are still the right ones for ACS. The next steps will start building path, the pathways to realize that preferred future. Some of those pathways will be academic. Perhaps the IB will be a part of that route. Others will be financial. But one of those pathways is particularly exciting because of an incredible advantage that one of our parents and board members gives us. Leo Veroni, the chair of our facilities committee, happens to be an architect at one of the preeminent firms that design schools around the world. I'm going to invite Leo to address us now about the extremely exciting process of taking a mission, vision, and core values built with consensus and turning them into physical structures with glass, bricks, wood, and stone. Leo, welcome. but also based on my experience of over 20 years working as architect and planners on uh, building many, many projects and working on many school renovations. Um, what I want to say is that ACS has a beautiful uh, campus, sitting at the foothill of incredible mountains with views overlooking the city of La Paz, surrounded by the Cordillera Real and uh, its incredible peaks. But also, if you look at from above uh, the campus of ACS, uh, it features a lot of open space and grounds and, uh, and fields, uh, which is a great, great value for a school. So tonight, I want to give everybody a very brief overview uh, of what a master plan is and the methodology that we as planners and architects use to transform and envision schools, right? Um, each school is really unique, so it deserves a unique design that is specifically tailored to transform and re-envision, re uh, basically, its, its future, right? So, uh, as Andrew was saying before, uh, the master plan really draws inspiration from the school strategic plan, which focuses on education, on building communities, on celebrating diversity, uh, creating uh, global citizens uh, that are understanding the local and global perspective of living in a 21st century world. But also, and this is very dear to me, uh, um, the plan focuses on creating a sustainable school and community where children uh, live in, uh, in learn spend most of their days in a very healthy and safe environment. So, as Andrew said before, uh, the strategic plan, which is the key tool for uh, creating a new and better school, uh, focus on a mission, on a vision for the future, establishing and confirming core values, and creating a consensus-based approach on defining the goals, how do we want to make ACS of the future, right? And then the last part is implementation. How do you transform these goals into actions, into um, tangible reality, right? And here it is where the master plan process uh, comes in. So some of you may have no idea what a master plan is, right? Uh, it's a document, it's a set of drawings, or images. It's a process, okay? that is collaborative, consensus-based, 
and really requires the inputs, feedback, and collaboration of the entire school community. This is why Andrew was asking everybody collaboration. That is key for the success of the master plan, of the strategic plan, and, and better ACS in the future. So at the end, the master plan provides a long-term framework for the school future growth and development. So the master plan focuses different in many areas uh, from learning to teaching to creating a strong school community and really to create a future and global citizen of the world where the world's sustainability and environmental stewardship is really key. So the master plan philosophy that we use is research and experience based. We want to design a school environment that is focused and centers on our children, the students, their health, their wellness, their well-being, their safety. So we want to focus on the whole child, the children. Uh, our uh, goal is to engage the school community, the stakeholders, you parents, the students, you know, the faculty, the staff, the leadership. We want to better understand the local context within the global context. And most importantly, we strongly believe that well-designed school and school environments are really critical and have a major impact, positive impact, on the student experience and learning. This is just an example. This is a school that we designed in Washington, D.C., Dunbar High School. Uh, Dunbar has been considered the greenest school in the world. It has achieved 91 out of 100 lead credits, which means it's basically, as I said, the most sustainable school in the world right now. The US Green Building Council, which is uh, uh, the global uh, sustainability certification institution, has defined uh, Dunbar as a masterpiece for a green learning environment. And what is most important, the school opened, I believe, a couple of years ago, that the school posted, after its opening, the highest test score gained among all the schools in D.C. This is just a witness of what I was saying before, how important is the school physical environment and the impact it has on the school, uh, on the children's performance and on the student, you know, well-being. So, our approach is knowledge-based and research-based. What does it mean? We want to create a high-performance learning environment. And to do that, we do a lot of research before drawings and envisioning the new schools. We work with the universities, we work with the research institutions to really understand, uh, you know, what creates an high-performing, the best and uh, the most inspiring uh, environment for, for the children. So, just let me spend a few words about high-performance environment. The classrooms, a library, uh, an academic space needs to have certain levels of daylight, of natural light. We want to avoid lighting glare that can blind the children. We want to make sure that the children who spend most of their early life in a classroom they feel comfortable in terms of temperature, humidity. We don't want classrooms that are too noisy, right? And most importantly, we want to make sure that they, they breathe fresh air. The level of CO2 needs to be below a certain level. It's scientifically proven that uh, the better and the more fresh air there is in a classroom, the student's performance is higher, and they feel better, they are more engaged. So, what are the key elements in the main phases of the mass? First of all, and I go back to what Anne was saying before, uh, we as a newcomer, the first thing we want to do, we want to listen, we want to understand, we want to learn what ACS is about in this case, right? Uh, um, the history, the value, their mission. Then the second thing, we want to assess the existing condition of, phys of the physical facilities to start understanding which are the issues, the problems, and also the opportunities, right? We want to start looking at the uh, current program with uh, the school and academic leadership, understanding the potential for enrollment growth, 
the changes, the addition, and we want to do also what we call the benchmarking, which is looking at the other schools, both locals and globally, and to see how uh, ACS uh, falls into. The second part is again about listening, learning, and sharing with you, uh, because we want to know what the community, the parents, the teacher, the administrators, cleaning people, uh, want ACS to become. This is really critical and we do that with different uh, means and tools like we're going to send around surveys about what you like, your hope, your dreams. We're going to have interviews with specific uh, leaders but mostly we're going to have focus groups with the different stakeholders and those are represented by the school leaders, uh, the principals but mostly by the students. We want to hear from them. They are the main users and we want to hear from you, hear from you, the parents, the alumni. That is really critical because again, the master plan process is consensus based and is collaborative. And finally, obviously, the master plan implementation, right, which is made of different phases, starting from uh, understanding uh, uh, the buildings, the site, start developing designing principles, um, concepts and finally developing what we call a final master plan, which is the physical roadmap for the growth and the future of ACS. So, I really uh, love this picture that I think dates back to the 50s when first ACS came to, to campus. And this is an example of what we want to learn about, how the school came about, uh, its initial vision, their values, also, we want to assess, uh, assess, as I said before, the physical conditions of the schools, particularly the academic spaces, the classrooms, the libraries. Uh, we're going to basically look at different types of spaces and actually score them uh, based on different factors. Uh, natural light, size, thermal uh, um, conditions, so on and so forth, to get a better sense, a snapshot of you know, the existing conditions comparing to the other school, comparing to the baseline and understanding where we are and how much, how much work we need to do to really improve the physical conditions. Uh, one of the first steps would be understanding the current academic program, if the classrooms and the academic spaces are big enough, if new programs uh, need to come in, looking at 21st century pedagogic uh, uh, you know, goals, we want to see also, you know, compare the programming of ACS with other peers and competitors. Basically, what we want to do at the end, we want to right-size the school, right? Create a roadmap by identifying the needs and the requirements. If the school enrollment needs to grow, how much can it grow based on the facility and the programming, the class sizes, so on and so forth. So, the programming aspect is really key to look at the future and the innovation is the corner store for a master plan. So, a few examples of other aspects that we look at is benchmarking. One of the key metrics of, uh, uh, of the analysis phase for a master plan is understanding how many square feet each student has uh, in its classroom and compare it to its peers, both locally, French school, the German school, and also globally, and also looking at the benchmarking in the United States. This is just an example of one of the works of the parents and students to talk about the future of the school, hopes and dreams, ideas, suggestions. We're going to hopefully have a lot of them in the next few months and years. So these are all questions that we really need to hear from you, the parents, the students, the administrators, everybody. So there's gonna be there are gonna be a lot of meetings, focus groups, and that will help really the uh, school administrator and leadership, uh, the designers, the planners, to develop a series of what we call design principles, which are the way to translate vision, goals, into actions, into projects, into improvements. And we start looking at the physical aspect of the school and of the campus, looking at 
access, arrival experience, security, solar orientation for the well-being of the students in their classrooms. And again, all of this work and discussions and ideas will then uh, trickle down and create a series of design principles that will represent the framework based on which the master plan will be developed, the plan will be drawn. And in the future, they will become the reference point if in 10, 20 years, people will, will start asking why you did this. So, the last part of the presentation, hopefully you are not bored enough, I want to show you just a few examples of some of the uh, projects that we did um, uh, all over the world and especially in uh, Latin America. As I said before, uh, my firm has over 40 years of experience in designing schools, uh, over basically 60 schools internationally in 22 countries, and again, we designed the two greenest schools in the world. And both of them, surprisingly enough, are in Washington DC, Dumbart, that you saw before, and John Lewis Elementary School. But we did master plan and improvement plans for the International School of Panama, the Colegio Americano in Guatemala, and also the Colegio Aleman in, uh, in Ecuador. And these are just some images I want to share with you about what does it mean to re-envision a school and using the new technology, computer animation, 3Ds and renderings, to really visualize and help uh, the stakeholders uh, to see what their school could look like. This is the International School in Hanoi, uh, the Shining uh, International School in China, where we start, we focus on creating more open and welcoming environment with a lot of natural light, soft seating, a relationship with the outer spaces, create a communal spaces as the core uh, spaces in the school. And the key study that I wanted to show uh, to you tonight is the uh, Franklin Roosevelt School in Lima, Peru, where we basically uh, transform and uh, uh, renovate an existing campus by envisioning the approach and the arrival sequence, the parking, we redesigned the outdoor spaces and uh, uh, sports fields, and we built a brand new academic uh, wing. At the beginning of the study, we asked a lot of questions. We look at the site, the solar orientation, the wind, to then start developing a series of ideas and concepts with uh, the input of the school community. And these are just a few examples of uh, the visuals that we developed at the beginning uh, to start sharing and discussing uh, design options and what the school could look like. And I want to show you in a moment a quick uh, uh, 3D uh, uh, virtual tour of the school that we developed using computer-based technology to help, again, uh, the students, the parents, the faculty visualizing uh, what the school could look like. Again, these tools nowadays are very, very helpful. So before we used to do physical models or drawings. Uh, tell you the truth, this technology of virtual tours and 3D modeling is really, really dramatic, really helps visualizing three-dimensionally and have to walk through uh, those spaces that, that want to be basically. And again, and this is the end result of the work. The actual design of the school. We focus a lot of uh, on open spaces, on natural light, on create uh, outdoor classroom from the ch for the children, communal spaces where the entire school community can gather, uh, and uh, we build a brand new academic uh, wing. As you can see, a lot of colors, very exciting, very welcoming, and saying to everybody, we are, you know, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt School, and we're looking at the future. And I'm really proud, especially of the re-envisioning of the classrooms, which ACS really did, right? <laughs> uh, a lot of natural light, good artificial lighting, a lot of bright colors, and especially very modern, light, and flexible furniture. And again, this is, that was the last slide of my presentation. Again, I just want to 
uh, thank Andrew for this opportunity and thank everybody for your attention and we look forward for a fruitful relationship because we really need everybody's help to re-envision uh, uh, ACS of 2015. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Leo. I think that's. Uh, I, I, I think I won't be alone in saying that that's truly inspiring. And, uh, and 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 when I say that we that we need to think big and think aspirational, not looking to the past but looking to the future for inspiration, I think it's a wonderful example. At this point, um, oops, sorry. At this point, we've, uh, we're, we're at the end of our formal part of our presentation, but we'd like to invite everyone to join us for, uh, for tea out, in, uh, out in, in the lobby and, and outside in the courtyard. Um, thank you very much to all of you for spending your, uh, your afternoon and evening with us, and thank you for your commitment to the school, and I hope you'll join us in, in envisioning what ACS can be in the future. Thank you.